So thank you everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, and let's start right away because we don't have that much time, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, uh, today we're going to talk about quite interesting topic. Today we're going to talk about why is it important to talk about, well, why is it important to be aware about, to pay attention to some interesting low-level details when you're working with, not necessarily Postgres, with pretty much every database in general. First of all, a little bit of background. So yeah, I'm a, my name is Dimitri, I work for Zalando well, for a couple of years already. Uh, I'm longer with the PostgreSQL community, and from my contributions you probably used before, uh, JSONB functions or something from recently like mm, pluggable storage support for PSQL and pgdump and so on. Yeah, and in Zalando, we're doing something like that. So unfortunately, due to various reasons, we have to run Postgres in a really, really a lot of different environments. So it's uh, just a legacy, kind of a legacy data centers. It's just uh, pure cloud AWS. It's of course inside Docker, inside Kubernetes, a lot, a lot of different environments. We're doing this, I must say, successfully. Thanks for two open source projects that you can check out on GitHub. They're really popular. For example, Patroni is like, what, two and a half thousand stars on GitHub already and being used by a lot of different companies. And Postgres Operator, for example, it's our own Kubernetes Operator that was this year accepted and accessed yeah, as far as I remember, successfully completed Google Summer of Code. So yeah, we're doing really interesting stuff. Uh, and somehow this situation was actually uh, the basis why I decided to make this presentation, make this talk. Uh, this situation that we have to run Postgres in different environment because every time it's not exactly a challenge, but quite frequently, quite often we see some interesting uh, problems or issues that happens on, on, on an interaction between Postgres and something else. So let me show and a little bit more details. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you are actually using PostgreSQL. Can you uh, raise your hand if you're using Postgres? Cool. And who are who of you are just interested in curious? Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, normally when you have database Postgres, well, pretty much any other database too, if you want to know what happens inside, of course, database provides you a lot of different views and informations. For Postgres, usually they call pgstat something, pgstat activity, pgstat statements, whatever. And usually, like, I don't know, 99% or no, 90%, much smaller actually, uh, this information is enough to figure out what's going on. But this information has one drawback. This information is basically what displays either the state of your data or the intention, intention of your database. Obviously, this information cannot tell you a little bit more. Obviously, this information cannot provide you something from the outside of Postgres itself. And now we suddenly realize, aha, but we run Postgres not in the vacuum. We run Postgres on top of some operation system. And then people start already thinking, aha, but like we should monitor something here because here it's basically kind of a connection. Postgres interact with the operation system. Something could go wrong, so we have to monitor it too. Okay, usually people are saying, let's monitor something global. Let's monitor like CPU utilization or IO utilization or stuff. But then suddenly people realize, aha, but we run not only just inside some particular operation system, we run also inside some Docker container, inside C group. And already at this point, people started to scratch their head and thinking, aha, what should we monitor in this case? Because obviously it's another level of complexity and introduce another interesting tricks and something other interesting situations and it's already not that clear what to do here. Uh, they're starting to read some strange blog posts, some outdated documents, and of course, sometimes having some wrong decisions. And then they suddenly realize that things are even worse. They're running this container on top of some virtual machine in cloud provider, and they're like totally confused. And then as a paramount of this stuff, this virtual machine is a part of Kubernetes cluster, just one of the nodes, and those people are completely lost. They have no idea what to monitor. And instead of just one nice PostgreSQL, we have a lot, a lot of different layers. Uh, usually at this point, people are saying, okay, we're a serious business. We don't have time to uh, think about this low-level stuff. Let's just reboot our server, start our database, and try it, and hope that everything goes away. Of course, usually it's not happening like that. And this, uh, well, in the nearest future, most of the time, this uh, error, this problem, this issue appear once again. Uh, and I don't agree with this approach, first of all, yeah, because um, it's not really, it's just a mitigation of a problem, but uh, just the symptoms. This problem will, be, will appear more and more and more and more. But the second you're losing people, well, not you, people who are doing this way, they're losing really important uh, knowledge about how their system work. And without this knowledge, sometimes it could be hard to reason about performance and about your system in general. So yeah, uh, a little bit of agenda. Unfortunately, there is 
if you want it, there is no plan whatsoever for these slides. It's basically a collection of different use cases that I found interesting or useful, where uh, issue itself could not be troubleshooted within the Postgres itself, and you have to apply some different approach. You have to step back a little bit, start to think outside of the box, and apply some different techniques. So, I say that we have to apply some different, like, information sources, so what are we talking about? And yeah, if you desperately need some plan, here is approximately kind of a plan for these slides. So first of all, and this is quite often, well, underestimated by people, let's say in this way, is a source code of the product you're using. And I really highly, highly try, uh, I would try to encourage you to read the source code at least for PostgreSQL because it's just amazing code base, it's amazingly documented, and sometimes you can get even more information from the PostgreSQL source code itself than from the documentation. We did it a few times, for example, I did many, uh, personally when there was some uh, script problems between different versions, and I just tracked down this change from the source code back in the Git, and then found out only afterwards that there was some documentation for that. For Linux, for example, for Linux kernel, it's a little bit of a different beast, but still all the new stuff like, you know, Kyber, Schedule, or Cgroup version 2, they're also decently documented and decently written. It's also nice to read them. The second section is about tools that usually administrators know about, like S-Trace, well, maybe not that of a GDB, but nevertheless, and Perf. Uh, the third source is basically those visual file systems that Linux kernel provides us. So BrocFS, SysFS, and some others. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit, of, well, not a little bit, significant amount of time we're going to devote to BPF, uh, extended BPF and BCC. So yeah, the first example. Let's imagine you have a PostgreSQL, relatively recent version, 11, 12 something. And then you run some analytical query, and you've got suddenly, without, instead of a result, you're getting this error. Blah, 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 could not recite shared memory segment, and so on and so forth. Usually this error could lead to panic, uh, well, for people who don't know what to do. Uh, but in fact, we can easily, relatively easy, straightforward troubleshoot it. So here we can deploy straightforward as trace thingy. So for those of you who, I hope everyone knows, but just to remind us, trace is basically a tool that allows you to show all the system calls that your application is doing. Not everyone is aware that there is a nice, in the modern version of S trace, there is a nice key minus K that allows you to also show the full stack trace from the application, if available, of course, for this particular uh, system call. So how to troubleshoot this problem? We have a Postgres, we attach to the backend, and we start, see, we, we start tracing and we say, aha, we open this uh, shared memory segment, we, and we try to allocate something, and we failed. And where came we? Where we came from this to this system call? We came here exact init parallel plan. So obviously Postgres is trying to do something in parallel. And then everything fits into the place in a relatively modern version of Postgres. Finally, parallel worker started to work properly. Uh, but every parallel worker requires a separate shared member segment. And then there is another catch that we see quite frequently. Unfortunately, Docker by default limit DefSHM to 64 megabytes. And of course, for huge analytical queries, sometimes it's not enough. Here we are. You may say that it's kind of a hack and cheat because obviously you cannot really analyze errors from within the application itself when the error is happening. So here is another example where S-Trace also could be pretty useful and this is more performance related. So here there is a such uh, interesting feature called, interesting stuff called virtual data stamp objects. It's basically a feature that allows us to perform some particular system calls like well, most of the time it's time related, uh, get time of day or clock time without switching to kernel space, which is nice because then we don't get this heat of a switching. Uh, and yeah, of course, it gives us some performance boost. But then the problem is, not everyone aware about this, that not all hypervisors support this feature, unfortunately. For example, most notoriously, Xen hypervisor. And if you're working with AWS infrastructure, you know that they have different generations. And uh, whether if M5 generation is in KVM, where this feature is supported, M4, for example, uh, which is still in use, uh, is not supporting because it uses Xen. So let's imagine you have this situation, you have a Postgres, and you have a different instances type, and you want to figure out how much performance hit you get by this situation. For example, you have two different nodes, and you see that one database perform on one node a little bit slower than the other, and the only difference is like, for example, instance type. So again, super straightforward, we uh, attach in our S trace, and whenever we see the system, real system calls we're doing, we, uh, that means that we are really switching to a kernel space, and we are uh, having this performance hit. 
Okay. Normally, I, I have to admit I'm giving this presentation probably too often. So normally, at this point, I'm saying about scheduling CPU migration, but this example is pretty artificial, especially in a uh, in a case that when we have something more interesting and real to talk about, it's this vulnerability called memory data sampling. If I remember correctly, um, it happened to be this year, not that not that, well, it's like a few months already or something. It's similar, it's like this one of these uh, CPU-related hardware vulnerabilities, similar to Spectre from the last year. Uh, and yeah, of course, there is a mitigation for pretty much every decent operation system. And obviously, this mitigation involves some performance hit. So now let's imagine you have the situation. You have your PostgreSQL running on top of some hypervisor, and then this hypervisor was patched. And you want to figure out how much performance degradation you will get. Normally, it's pretty hard to answer it from the Postgres itself, and that's why we deploy something more powerful. We we're going to deploy perf. Uh, and then, when we start to just do simple CPU sampling, we see that suddenly one system call, call one function from the kernel called do system call 64, suddenly takes too much time in comparison with previous snapshots. If we zoom in, we found out something really interesting. We found out this instruction, verify W, and everything fits into a place after we read in what exactly this mitigation from the Linux kernel was about. And this mitigation, this instruction was actually kind of overridden. And before, this instruction was doing almost nothing, but now this instruction also flushes all the CPU buffers. And that's we see that here we see like almost 30% we're spending on this function. That's basically where all this heat arc is uh, coming from, all the performance heat. But then there is an interesting stuff that sometimes you can even notice that in a different way. For example, we were running uh, some Ubuntu on top of patched hypervisor, but Ubuntu itself was not patched itself, and we saw the very same situation via relatively high rates of usage of time sampling spent on native safe hole, which usually just say that your system is idle, but it wasn't the case. That was super strange. We spent a few days trying to figure out what's wrong, and then it turns out that, yeah, indeed, this mitigation was also inserted to this uh, save hold function, and here we are that basically the reason how we indirectly figured out exactly in the day when this vulnerability was disclosed that something's happening. Another really nice example why perf could be really useful outside of Postgres, and in fact for not only Postgres itself, for many other applications, is something that called log holder preemption problem. This problem is so severe that even CPU vendors provide some one or, that or another solution for this problem. Most of, well, for example, if we're talking about Intel, it's called pause loop exiting. Let me show the nice diagram to explain how does it work. So let's imagine we have a hypervisor, and then let's imagine this hypervisor has four virtual CPUs. And two of them are active, and two of them are preempted. And now let's imagine that we're running Postgres on top of it. And now let's imagine that something happened. For example, Visual CPU wants some back and there is doing some work, doing some select or whatever, I don't know, update. And then it happened that C2 is waiting for C1. Well, on the lock or something. Normally, of course, it's not a problem because usually, for example, when we're talking about locks, especially spin locks, they should be taken for a really short amount of time. But then we're talking about like real hardware, like bare metal. Here, what could happen is supervisor can say, OK, C1 got enough time. Let's preempt it and give some time to C4, which run in a different background, um, different backend from PostgreSQL, which is doing something different. And now we have this interesting situation. Uh, what's supposed to be a really short amount of time for waiting for C2 now is like unexpected amount of time, whatever hypervisor is saying. And what's even more, well, yeah, in this situation, this post loop exiting, basically what does it do? It tries to prevent such idle loops. But it does tries to prevent this by sending a, a basically an exit from the guest to the hypervisor, which is also kind of a switch from the user to kernel space, which is also a performance hit. Uh, now we have this in mind, and we want to figure out how much does it affect our performance. Here's a Two examples, here are two examples that I've performed. In fact, uh, it was performed on my own machine, but nevertheless, you can see the results, they are different. So what I'm doing here is the very same setup, the very same database, it was wiped out from the, wiped out from the, from the scratch. Uh, with the only difference, this database was running inside KVM virtual machine, and this key, uh, KVM virtual machine, in the second case, PLE was disabled completely. And then we were running just pgbench workload, normal read-write workload against the database. And then we can see suddenly that 
with PLE enabled, we've got uh, average latency even higher than without, which means that in this particular situation, our CPU was so much saturated that pause, that pause loop exiting was interrupting a real waiting in our case and basically doing bad for our performance. So it was a negative impact, but of course it could be not always like that. I'm just showing that this feature could be bad. Well, there is a pros and cons for this feature, so of course you have to measure it for yourself. Yeah, here we have to make a little bit of a detour, uh, and for the next sections I have to explain uh, some basics about how Postgres works, and not only Postgres, in fact, pretty much any storage-based database. So normally we have some processes that are running, like, well, backends that are doing some job, and then some background uh, writers and, for example, checkpointers. Then we have some memory, in, of course, in pages in the middle. Then we have a transactional local write ahead lock from the right side, and then we have operation system cache and storage. The point is that Postgres uh, basically does all the writes, all the I.O. is buffered in Postgres PL, which means we rely a lot on the Linux kernel itself. So what happens when we are working with this database? So let's imagine we decided to update something. So let's imagine our data was like, well, you know, our cache was warm, we decided to update a few pages. Of course, first of all, we have to write write ahead lock. That's how all the stuff is working. Then uh, what happens is that we uh, record this information, and now we do not sync this immediately. Now, kick, a background writer kicks in. Background writer tries with some particular configuration, synchronize from time to time those dirty buffers with operation system cache. So no, not with the storage itself, just with operation system cache. Then, from time to time, kicks in a component, well, basically an external, which is not exactly a part of our Postgres, which is not exactly under our control. So what does it do? It, from time to time, tries to uh, also synchronize operation system cache with the real storage. Depends also on some configuration, uh, dirty background, radio, dirty radio, and so on and so forth. And eventually, when we're doing checkpoint, we synchronize everything to the storage eventually to preserve the data, of course. So what does it mean? It means that even in this schema, we rely significantly on several parts, for example, on uh, kernel memory management, on buffer I.O., and in general, a lot on Linux kernel. So, and one more, I think, the last nice, but really nice example for perf, how to do the perf for PostgreSQL is how to check how much performance you can get from huge pages. Somehow it happened, I'm not sure if it's true in this audience, but sometimes somehow it happened that, for example, for databases, people are not always aware what are the huge pages for, how do they work, and somehow they are like surrounded by some mysterious uh, mystery around them. Yeah, yeah, here we're talking not about transparent, only about classic huge pages. So here, to figure out this, we can use the very same schema as before. First of all, read the documentation. Linux documentation says that huge pages are good because they are doing TLB, transaction local side buffers, for misses faster and they are a little bit less happening, less frequently. So we have this information. It's a kind of a theory we have to prove or disprove for our, for our purposes. So here again, we do just an experiment. Everything is basically about experimenting with your own setup, which, because it's basically important. No one can say something for you in advance. So here is again just a simple example, simple database on bare metal, with only one difference. The first one is using huge pages, the second one is not. And then we're smart, now we're recording with perf, we're recording till the uh, loads and stores misses. And then, yeah, we see that in the, se in the first case, when we have these huge pages, we have 19%, well, yeah, almost 20% less uh, load misses and almost 30% less load misses, which is quite nice. Which is, it's nice not only because um, uh, we kind of checked something, it's nice because we checked one exactly component. Normally, when people are doing some benchmark, they're, they're trying to benchmark the whole you know, pipeline, the whole uh, set of actions from the ground to, from the client to the storage. And of course, there could be some other influences. Here we checked one particular component, we know that it's there, and now from this, from this point we can derive some latencies. Okay, so what we were doing before uh, can be described as um, stateless uh, measurement. So we were just having some events, we were attaching to those events, something happened, we get some information, and we just forgot about it afterwards. Uh, but then, BPF was, well, extended BPF introduced. So originally we had BPF, Berkeley packet filtering, that was with us like since 90s or something. And eventually just, well, originally just a byte code that we could execute within the scope of our kernel, uh, normally for TCP processing or something like also pretty stateless. But then extended BPF 
thanks to uh, Alexei Star weather force introduced, and now we have totally amazing powers. Now we have stateful measurement. So now we can respond to some events in the kernel or in the application itself. So here, yeah, we can attach to any function within a kernel or within an application, which is important, which allows, uh, which just opens a lot, a lot of possibilities how to use this. We can use registers, stacks, maps, and everything. And to not make it just a word words, I will, I prepare some demo. Let's see if something go wrong this time. So what happens here? I hope you can see. I hope it's big enough. So we have several panes here, several windows. And the first, we have just PostgreSQL running. PostgreSQL and then PCQL attached to this Postgres. Nothing particular. Now here in this window, we have all the BCC tools available. So um, first of all, I have to tell you that, of course, normally when we are working with extended BPF, it's pretty complicated. We have to write, pretty complicated to write JIT uh, code by itself. That's why there are different tools. Most important, most famous of them is BCC, BPF compiler collection that allows us just to write some lines of Python code to generate this BPF program. So here, in this window, we exactly have this, pro uh, this, uh, this program. And what can we do? Well, simple, simplest thing we can do is, for example, we can tra trace Postgres exec simple query. So what we're doing here right now, we're tracing some query, and then when, for example, execute something like select one, we see this query happens. So we have some feedback. And now we're doing the second time, we're doing the second, we see the second time. So it could be, for example, super useful to measure latencies between queries. Of course, Postgres provides this information for you, but there are different pros and cons. For example, this information provided as part of the log information with some particular thresholds, and so on and so forth. So sometimes it could be really nice to get exactly in this format. Plus, well, I explain it later, but the point is that this information we can also do, we can also process within the kernel itself, which means that we are much more performant, and uh, we can, for example, filter this information based on a lot of different, uh, a lot of different conditions. But what happens in the background when we're doing this? Sorry, trace is a part of PCC. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's one of those Python scripts. I can show you. It's basically uh, user share BCC tools. Here they are. It's just a Python script that does all this stuff, and that's what I'm going to explain right now. So when we run this trace, what happens? Tools, proc list. So BPF, it's just a Python script, oh, I'm sorry, BCC, it's just a Python script. It uses, it generates some C code that was then on the fly compiled by LLVM backend into BPF jitted code. Then BCC itself again via perf API created a performance event, well, user probe. And then <laughs> BP, BCC attaches to this BPF program to this user probe and plus also create a map to store some information. So here we can see, for example, this user, uh, this uh, BPF program that was created and here we can see map that was created by this program. Uh, but as we figured out, the problem is, well, not exactly a problem, but this involves a lot of stuff. It involves generation on the fly, it involves some Python interpreter, and we, just see, we have seen some situation when this, um, let's say, performance overhead sometimes could be too much for us. Because, for example, port in Kubernetes is so much overloaded, we just could not even run the Python interpreter by itself. But the good point is that it's not even necessary. Eventually, we have to basically to get BPF uh, program by itself. So. Uh, what can we do for that? First of all, we have to, as I said before, we basically can produce the very same, the very same list of actions as BCC is doing. First of all, we can create user probe. So let's say, uh, then perf probe expand Postgres, and then exec simple query. Yep, and exec simple query return. So now. If we will check, we have, so here we are going, we are checking the trace, trace FS, and here we have different information, and we can check that we have those events created. And then, I already prepared it, I think, here, yep, something called BPG latency, something, yeah. So here we have basically some already compiled uh, BPF program from the C, source code by LLVM backend with only, I will explain the sketch later, but we already have kind of a compiler. So what we can do is we can literally just run it, PG latency. Now it starts, now there is, we can check again. There is a BPF program, there is a BPF map, 
So everything is pretty much the same, well, except some small details like name and so on. And this program right now is waiting for some event. And if we go, for example, in doing this, yeah, we will get this. So this program right now is basically doing this, it's showing this one single element in the loop. But what's really nice about this stuff, what's really curious is that uh, before, as I showed you before, BCC created a BPF map. We can see this BPF map, for example, sysfs BPF maps. So maps, it was created by me, but here is latency. So this is exactly a map that we created, and normally it's not visible. But with BPF, we can uh, pin this map, and it's really convenient, because then we can, for example, read this map separately, which means that, for example, we can keep one value, or like less recently used values in memory, and update it quite frequently, but then do not use it and just discard them when we don't need it. Which means that we are not going to be, for example, overload this information, we're not going to overload our servers or something, and then we can, for example, just execute PG latencies reader and then just get this value and that's pretty much it which is nice which is mean that due this uh, via the spinning of maps we can separate these concerns and it's pretty much nice for monitoring purposes but there is one catch i think i have this yep so the problem is that no, not exactly a problem but interesting situation is that to be able to run this bpf program you have to call, uh, execute system called bpf which is require one argument uh, kernel version exact kernel version you're going to run into uh, well, with this program. And of course, if you, for example, have different setups, different infrastructure, have different variety of different Linux kernel, and compiling on one machine, it could be pretty com problematic because you have, have to specify literally one here. But then eventually, I was trying to use originally just this uh, elf parser to change this version. There was a problem because elf parser eventually was generating a little bit different binary, a little bit different and, uh, hash and so on. So eventually I just uh, ended up replacing this manually with XXD, uh, which works nice. Just you replacing this section in your program and it works everywhere. Yeah, it's, 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 it could be silly, but if it works, it's not silly. <laughs> So yeah, that's a, that was a small trick, and yeah, the only another thing that I want to mention is that be careful when you're running this in Ubuntu, because starting from some point, I have no idea when, they're showing wrong uh, Linux kernel version with U name, they're showing the last patch version of it zero, and you have to, I was not understanding why it's not running, why it's complaining, it turns out that you have to check the correct version from proc, uh, proc version signature, just for you to know. Okay, that was the sh short demo, short example, and now let's return to our presentation. So yeah. Uh, as I said before, we have VCC, which is really nice, really popular, but kind of a generic. So for our purposes, for my own purposes, I've created something more PostgreSQL specific, so you can check it out if you're interested. And here are a few examples. For example, we can check last level cache misses and loads, but per backend, per query, which is really mind-blowing, because basically normally we're doing this kind of in a global set. But of course, it's not that convenient, for example, when you have to share your uh, database with some other clients with different patterns, with different data access patterns. And this could be really nice, for example, when you're trying to deploy, when you're trying to figure out cache, last level cache access patterns, to figure out how to use, for example, these technologies about cache sharing like Intel uh, Resource Director, for example. Yep. I mentioned before that and we already, sh we already seen that memory management is super important. And another component that's super important is uh, Buffer.io. And was well, one component of it is, of course, write back. So now let's imagine, just let's forget about BPF for, for a second. Let's imagine we're smart. We know that there is event, event a performance event from Linux, kernel, or write back written. And now we know that it's important. We have to monitor it. We start to monitor with Perth. And then we see, aha, uh -huh, from time to time, a Linux kicks in and try to synchronize everything with the storage, which is not exactly nice for database, which means that it's basically saturating our I.O. And uh, for example, for write and write ahead log, it's already a problem for database. For modern devices like NVMe, like SSD, when they have uh, several uh, queues. It's not exactly that much of a problem because we still have capacity, some capacity to write, but then things could be worse. Uh, the point is that sometimes Linux kernel could inject uh, delays, timeouts to your process in case when uh, writeback is not keeping up with amount of dirty pages that your application is providing, your application is creating. And it's really nasty because if you think about this, it's really kernel inject delays in your business critical application when you want to return result within like milliseconds or even less than nanoseconds or something. Uh, 
and yeah, to, uh, to monitor this information. Unfortunately, there is no event uh, from the perf, at least by now. Uh, that's why I've created also some small uh, script timeouts. And this is just an example. We have just PG bench and serve workload with some relatively big amount of memory. And in this particular case, we get just four situations when Linux kernel injected these delays. But of course, you can imagine on a huge server with like uh, 128 gigabytes memory or more, it could be much worse. So probably the last section. Uh, it's about Kubernetes. So it's still questionable whether it's good or not to run database in Kubernetes, but at least part of the answer is that sometimes it's convenient. So that's why we're doing this. And if you're aware on Kubernetes, you can manage resources via manifest when you specify resources, requests, and resources limit. And as I said before, for us, man memory management is super important. And let's imagine we run our database in Kubernetes inside bot, and we're talking about memory right now. So my first reaction when I was <laughs> going through this stuff was that, aha, probably request memory request corresponds to C group soft limit in bytes. And limit corresponds to hard limit in bytes. That was my first reaction. But of course, with Kubernetes, you should be prepared that some obvious answers are not that obvious usually. And um, the first memory request it has nothing to do with soft limit at all. In Kubernetes, soft memory limit basically used only for the purpose of internal scheduling, uh, yeah, to figure out, for example, classes of service and to calculate OOM and just and something like that. So, okay, we figured this out. And uh, from this, I had another theory. I, could, I thought, okay, then it's cool. It means that we don't have this soft limit, which means we don't have, for example, memory reclaims, because we're not going to over soft memory limit, and then kernel does not, is not trying to reclaim our memory. And then, of course, I was wrong. Because of the thing that called memory pressure, especially for containers, uh, well, containers are designed to be uh, allocated in a way that they already have memory relatively close to what your application is needing, which means that we're already close to the highest memory limit we have, just by default. And which means that we, by default, have memory pressure already quite high. And just due to this memory pressure, we have quite frequently this memory claim, nevertheless. And we've already seen situations when it has super overloaded pods with databases, and we're doing those memory memory claims quite, quite often, especially where, when we're on the edge of, for example, uh, out of memory OM kill. Yeah, and here's a nice example that all this stuff, well, at least most of those scripts, you can actually use even with some particular Docker container ID. Nowadays, I think starting from 4.18, you can also use cgroup ID, but uh, it's not exactly correlated, for example, with Docker container ID, so I still have this possibility. Yep. Uh, the last section is about, so I, I basically I said everything about that's super powerful, that the problem is that in uh, every different infrastructure it's kind of painful to run it still. So for example, if you want to try it on your local, on your just laptop, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to check that your debug is mounted, and you have to check that those parameters for Linux kernel are there, but normally they are there on the all modern distributions. There is no, uh, no magic here. A little bit of magic happens when you want to run this on Docker. First of all, of course, there's going to be this machinery with the bug and symbols. You have to do not forget to copy them from there or to use them from there because it's kind of separated. But then, of course, you have to run a Docker container with privileges, extra elevated privileges, because all this uh, BPF and tracing stuff requires extra privileges. Uh, but then as a nice perk, you can attach, you can create a separate container, separate monitoring container, and you can attach something to some your, to your application without you know, polluting this original container. Another kind of a trick here is that uh, until, well, Docker uses overlayFS, of course, and until, well, overlayFS or uh, other uh, overlays file systems, but uh, they all have one problem until 4.17, I guess. Uh, they were not supporting uprops, unfortunately, so you have to also be aware about that. And then probably the most of the time I spent trying to run all this stuff, BPF on Kubernetes. Of course, we require some elevated privileges. We require some elevated privileges from uh, account, uh, service account. Uh, but then uh, stuff that I spent probably most of, the, most of the time, it's exactly figuring out how to deal with different Linux kernel versions. Fortunately, for BPF and BCC, we can, uh, there is a, a variable called BCC Linux version code, which you can override just uh, on runtime. And when, only when you uh, know that this particular version is close enough to what you're supposed to run in. Otherwise, there could be some side effects. And of course, it's not nice. Yep. And the last section, really quickly, about how to break. Because all this stuff is really powerful, and with all the power comes, of course, great responsibility. 
This particular example I was trying, it, it was, in fact, it was quite outdated perf, so it doesn't really matter, but that was a really interesting situation. This outdated perf somehow could not handle situation when I was trying to extract some arguments. For example, in this case, I was trying to extract some information from trigger when uh, this information was null. And it was just crashing, and I was just trying to do some sampling, and I really, really crashed production backend, which is, of course, not that nice. Uh, another example is also that, well, unfortunately, software we're using is not without bugs. It's also with some outdated perf version. And I was trying to figure out how much, uh, how, how much write, uh, full page writes are we doing from PostgreSQL. And then when I executed this, I tried to create this probe. And then when I executed this perf stack, while trying to create this user pop, a probe in a non-interruptible sleep in a kernel mode, which means that nothing could stop it, nothing could kill it. And not only that, it basically means that all the Docker stack, all the machinery stack, and all pretty much everything stack, and the only thing that we could do is we had to restart the whole date. Well, in this case, it was fortunately a replica, so not a big deal, but still. And the last part, it's already outdated slides, but still, nevertheless, it shows how powerful and how scary this stuff could be. It's from 2018, and it was like Linux kernel version 4.4, quite ancient already at this point, but nevertheless, it's nice. It shows that with some relatively, you know, we do not get used to the situation that with Python we could get kernel panic, yeah, right? So it's kind of a scary. It's, of course, people are working on these bugs, but still, if you want to use this in production, you have to be aware and you have to be careful and you have to check stuff multiple times. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope you have a lot, a lot of questions. <laughs> yep, any questions? Come on, people. <laughs> no, I don't believe that. There should be some questions you're just shy enough to ask. But please be aware that there are no stupid questions. There are stupid questions. So I'm here under the danger. <laughs> oh, yeah, please. So how much of this? Uh, because you showed uh, mostly at the very beginning a lot of benchmarks and stuff like this regarding different uh, changes uh, between kernel versions, different uh, patches for CPU problems and so on. Do you have something that continuously runs in your system and benchmarks the stuff as the kernel updates are released, as the new bug fixes are released to get kind of overview what is good for you, what is not good. So maybe you want to wait with deploying some kernel, some bug fix and this kind of stuff. Or do you just do it when you get a call from someone that this database is now not working as it used to and then you retrospectively try to benchmark what may have changed? Well, we're not doing this unfortunately continuously. We're doing this on ad hoc, so sometimes we just go into our own because we want to know, for example, we know that there's a new version and stuff, or for example, our colleagues produced a new, uh, new well, distribution. And sometimes we're doing this, of course, that when people are complaining that something is wrong, but unfortunately, it's totally different level of complexity, continuously performance benchmarking. So yeah, we're kind of working on this right now because I have, right now, after, like, I, I spent about a few months already trying to, not trying, I successfully prepared uh, Kubernetes setup for benchmarking. It's kind of a continuous. It's right all the results uh, with all the plottings into S3 and so on and so forth. But it's at, uh, like at the very beginning right now, unfortunately. Yep, any other questions? Okay, then, thank you. Thank you, Dimitri.